Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, Hurricane Track here, Thursday now, the 12th of June, 2025. So very glad that you tuned into my video today. The main topic will be the potential for some development, very low potential probably, in the southwestern Caribbean Sea or the Western Caribbean. We'll look at, well, Caribbean, Caribbean, whatever. We'll look at that. We'll look at some severe weather chances. By the way, I'm in Parker, Colorado, not far from Denver. That is related to the severe weather stuff that we'll talk about at the end of today's update. And we will also take a look at the recent update from, speaking of updates, from Colorado State University and Dr. Phil Klotzbach. All of that and more in today's discussion. All right, again, thanks for tuning in. Well, let's get started. First, satellite animation. Now, look, this is really cool. I want to point this out from the get-go there is the Bermuda High. You can see it even in the satellite imagery. These clouds moving this way. These clouds up here moving this way. That's your clockwise flow. Come on, that is too cool. And I mean, really, you can see the influence of it going all the way through here, uh, funneling moisture from the Caribbean into the Gulf. And that is helping to fuel that big old mess of storms over mess or mass, whichever, southeast Texas, and I'll show you that on radar here in just a few minutes. A couple other things to point out to you. A little bit of a flare-up of some convection in the southwest Caribbean. We'll have to see if that is the impetus to get something going uh, that the GFS has really been on top of. The Euro, not so much. We'll look at that, of course, in just a few minutes. More convection over here and even more in the southeast Pacific, south of Mexico. And if we look at the interactive tracking map, that shows us our two areas here, one in yellow. Low chance of development over the next few days, but this one will probably go on to be Delilah and move on out into the open Pacific even when it does develop. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get an area that gets popped up over here. We'll see. The uh, Euro, not too enthusiastic. And we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. First, let me show you this. Let it reload here. This is from Dr. Mark Nissenbaum's website. We've referred to this site plenty of times over the years, especially when tropical systems are coming. Look at that big mass of storms, and yes, it is messy down here in southeast Texas. If you're flying into Houston, whether it be Hobby or Bush airports, uh, more power to you today because that looks pretty darn rough. And a, a big part of this, why I point this out, that deep fetch of moisture coming around this big fat Bermuda High is really funneling in the moisture from the Gulf into the south and even into the interior parts of the country all the way up into the northern plains where eventually we will see some more severe weather. We'll cover that at the end of today's update. But not tropically related in terms of a storm or anything, but the air mass, the Gulf, is just so warm that you get all this instability down there and these high dew points and precipitable water values in the atmosphere and that's getting wrung out over southeast Texas today. So pretty big problems down there, to be sure. All right. Our good friend Ben Knoll posted this recently here on the Twitter. Uh, some chance of development as we you know, go through the next uh, several days. This is the uh, weeklies here on the anomalies um, in the 200 millibar level of the atmosphere. Green is generally positive. The reddish, rusty color, whatever, is negative for development. So if we stop it right there, uh, July 7th, after the 4th of July period, should be shut down in the Atlantic, which is climatologically exactly what we would expect. But right now, coming up in the next few days, there's just a small little area right there. Uh, and really, you only need a small area like that. You don't have to have widespread favorability. But there's a small window of opportunity for something to develop and maybe, just maybe, something will come of that. Might be related to what we're seeing down here with this little flare-up of showers and thunderstorms. You know, that does make sense with uh, what Ben is showing here of this little favorable uh, window of opportunity. So what do the models show? Well, this is the Euro from the Zero Z run last night, and we're going to watch, let's just circle the big area right through here, and let's see what happens. Oh, by the way, there's that big fat ridge beautiful when you can see the weather. So the Euro really doesn't do much, focuses whatever energy there would be in the southeastern Pacific, and that's pretty much that. We take this out to 
well, that's 10 days. We'll just stop at a week right about there. Yeah, the euro does not do a lot. Maybe another piece of that tries to come together in the Bay of Campeche. We shall see. The GFS, on the other hand, a little bit more enthusiastic with it. This is the uh, zero Z run, and it backs off the ridging just enough that that area would concentrate east of Nicaragua. So we'll see. And then it moves on up from there towards the uh, Central American region and eventually in the Bay of Campeche. Uh, and, I mean, we don't know. I don't know how this will turn out, but there is a slight window of opportunity here, it would appear. Um, now, I want to go up to the 12Z because I've been putting stuff together long enough to prepare for this update that we can look at the 12Z GFS and see if it's still showing that similar evolution and through... Yep, it still does. And uh, so we'll see. I mean, the, we're only talking like 96 hours out. If it's that wrong, that close in time, you yeah, might have some problems with that model. We'll see. But something to watch for sure, especially if you have interest down here. Curiously, it does show the Southeast Pacific impulse as well, which is what the Euro is picking up on. So we'll watch it. We'll see what happens with that as we go forward. Maybe a little window opening up. Uh, we'll see, right? So Dr. Klotzbach put out an update, and just real quick, I know there's going to be comments, and people probably already talking about it that saw this yesterday. Why do they put out these updates at all, and why do they update them? It's like cheating. If you can continually update it, you eventually get it right. To which, and I think that's a very good, see that little uh, over here in the what's happening part? That's baseball. Sports analogy, once again, real quick. Coaches make adjustments during games. Scientists can make adjustments when they're doing their work. Nothing in science is constant. It's changing, okay? And so Phil and his colleagues, they all look at different parameters that are out there, and they change. And they can change on weekly timescales, monthly timescales, and so forth. Subseasonal, we call that. And so, yes, there are adjustments. Now, what is really interesting about this, the numbers really haven't changed since his initial outlook in April. So that tells us that confidence through June here, June 11th when the update was issued, is pretty good because the numbers didn't drastically change at all, really. 17 name storms total, that's a lot. Um, uh, what is it, nine hurricanes total, that's also a lot, and four major hurricanes. So I think it's what to take away from this is that he hadn't seen any reason to change the numbers up or down. And he lays out very specifically his reasoning behind this uh, forecast, all right? And I've been talking about this. We can all see it who follow this. The biggest thing is the unlikelihood of El Nino. I mean, come on. It's just at this point, you never say 100% until it's happening with the weather. I get it. But, I mean, we're not going to have an El Nino this year. And the data supports that. So he can take that and put it into his different uh, models that he's come up with over the years, decades really. And in fact, he's not far from where I am right now in Colorado here. And you can see, you know, those are the anomalies. It's not quite as warm out here as we saw recently, but this is ridiculous over here. Your subtropics are pretty warm. This is a pretty high correlation signal as well. Uh, not a gangbuster season, but no signal at all, really, that we will have an inactive season. You know, there's things that you don't, you, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? But the correlations are there. And it's really important that we stay on top of this stuff, all right? We've got a lot going on here in the United States and globally. you just got to be prepared. And this kind of stuff, I think, helps people to at least keep hurricanes and hurricane season on top of mind. This is not scare tactics or fear mongering. Just idiotic when people say that. I really believe that. This is informative and it should inform your decision to just stay on top of it. That's all. You don't have to get anxious or get worried. It's just one of those, all right, we got a busy season ahead of us, more than likely. So darn well better stay on top of it and do what we can individually and as communities and eventually as states and even on a federal level to do the best we can to be ready because we have a long way to go. It's only June 11th, 
and the peak season could be quite active. All right, so we'll get another update from Dr. Klotzbach later on down the road as we get into August, and it'll get refined even more. All right, makes sense. Why did we have a gateway timeout? Nobody asked for that. So severe weather for today limited the uh, the biggest chances of anything significant. This little yellow sliver, I'm not going to get that far into it. I'm going to probably head over to like the Cheyenne area when these initiate, and then I'm going to go meet a good friend of mine and his family for dinner right over there near Lafayette, Colorado. And then tomorrow I will definitely be active again in this slight risk area, more than likely somewhere in this region. We shall see on the quest for the big hailstones. It is a fascinating part of meteorology. Uh, I got some techniques, cameras, and a special little fishing net to catch it, catch it. and um, we'll keep on at it, as will. And this is really important to we'll wrap it up with this little piece of information, information for you. It's not just me. I'm sure you've heard me talking about it. The Ice Chip Project, IBHS, the uh, people from all over, I don't want to say all over the world, but it is a global effort, Australia, Canada, the U.S., and many dozens of scientists studying this phenomenon that literally costs every one of us money because hail is such a damaging part of severe weather and especially here in Colorado. One of my good friends and colleagues and supporters of the project, Matt, he can tell you all about it. He's had a couple of roofs replaced and he is sick and tired of the hail himself. Um, So it's an important thing and that's what I'm doing and honestly it helps to test equipment that we will be using during the upcoming hurricanes that we know are probably coming. So getting ready now in the field by testing things really does help me later on. Keeps keeps me on the edge where I gotta be. All right? You guys have a good rest of your Thursday. Thank you for tuning in. From all of us at Hurricane Track, I am Mark Suddeth. I'll talk to you again tomorrow.